Hello and welcome to this video on sociological theories of education. Our first perspective or theory is functionalism. I'm going to look at the ideas of a chap called Emil Durkheim. And there he is in the top right hand corner. Durkheim identified two main functions of education. Firstly, that it creates social solidarity. By this it means that it creates a sense of trust between members of society, we feel connected, we may even feel a sense of fraternity or brotherhood with other members of our society. And this helps to prevent lawlessness or anarchy, otherwise known as the state of nature. It's also a way in which we can transmit culture from one generation to the next, passing on society's norms and values. And so, for example, teaching history can help connect students to their shared heritage. It also promotes social integration, so that feeling of being connected or integrated with other members of society and helps to create also a collective conscience or a collective awareness of what is right and wrong, what is acceptable and what is unacceptable. In doing so, it helps to turn children into social beings. Functionists generally believe that when we're born, we are tabula rasa, we come into the world as a blank slate and it's only through a socialisation process that we learn how to behave and what is expected of us. In this sense, school is a society in miniature. It has its own rules, it has its own ways of being ordered, it has maybe even a hierarchy, and this is practice for later life, practice for the wider world, if you will. The second major function, according to Durkheim, is specialist skills, or the provision and teaching of specialist skills. So in modern economies, like ours in the United Kingdom, Individuals require specialist skills. If they want to get a job, ultimately, they're going to need a skill that they can go out and market their skills and earn money to provide for themselves. Also in modern economies, individuals work in what we refer to as a division of labour. And this may be something you want to search on YouTube for a video of, and in particular you may want to look at examples of division of labour in large factories. But put simply, it's that idea, if we imagine a conveyor belt in a factory, we had lots of workers on that conveyor belt, and every single one of those workers would do a different job. So if we were building a car, for example, it would be one person's job to fit the steering wheel, and it would be another person's job to fit a uh, windscreen, it'd be another person's job to fit the gear stick, and so on and so forth. So rather than having one person create the whole car, you'd actually get hundreds of people potentially working together, doing one job over and over to create lots of cars very quickly. And it's a very efficient way of working um, that, in particular, capitalism has benefited from. In doing so, it helps to create cooperation between specialists and therefore build social solidarity also. So if you are working as part of one of these teams in this hypothetical car making plant, you're going to feel a sense of connection and you're going to respect other people working on the conveyor belt because they've got special skills that perhaps you don't, but they're going to respect you also because you have a special skill that they may not have. And so in doing so, you're working together and again, you're building that sense of trust and solidarity. Our next functionalist is Talcott Parsons, who comes along a number of years later after Dirk come and kind of updates some of his ideas. Parsons said that education is a focal socialising agent, so it's a very important institution, as important perhaps as the family. That it is in fact the bridge between the family and society, so if we imagine for a moment that the family is kind of on one side of a riverbank, and then you've got the bridge over the river, to the other riverbank, which would be wider society, that bridge for Parsons is education. So it's really important, you need it to be able to join wider society. There are different rules for different children at home. So for example, parents may have their own rules with regards to say what the eldest is able to do versus what the youngest is able to do. So often, for example, uh, the eldest sibling or the eldest child is able to stay up later or receive more pocket money or can go out and play with friends, whereas perhaps younger siblings have to go to bed earlier, have less pocket money, or may only engage in supervised play, for example. Um, so we've got some differences there. Whereas in education, rules are universal and impersonal. That is, they apply to everyone equally. It doesn't really matter if you are year seven or year 11, or if you're in your first year of primary school last year, the rules apply to everyone. Everyone has to wear uniform. Everyone has to turn up at the same time. So in this sense, the rules are universal and impersonal. And that's good practice for wider society or later life where the laws of society apply to everyone equally. So once again, in education, you have the same rules for all. Uh, another example could be, if you think about exams, 
and it's going to be the same questions for everyone and the same pass mark for everyone. Parsons also said that in school, as in wider society, status is gained through achievement. So if you work hard in your job in wider society, you may be promoted. You may get a better job with better pay. If, however, you don't work hard or you don't turn up, you may be dismissed or fired. This is similar to what happens in school. If you work hard, you will gain status because you will pass your exams and you'll be able to go on to do maybe better A-levels or go to university and get a better job and that sort of thing. Or if you don't work hard, if you don't do your revision, you will fail your exams. In this sense, what we're seeing here is a meritocracy take place. And in a meritocracy, power, rank, influence and rewards are gained by individuals according to their individual merit. So if you as an individual work hard, you will be rewarded. If you do not work, you will not be rewarded. And it's up to you. If you have skills, intelligence, or you are willing to work hard and put in the hours, you will be recognized and rewarded as such. If, however, you don't do that, that won't happen. And so this is the basis of meritocracy. It's very important, however, if you want to have a meritocracy, that there must be equal opportunities for all. Everyone, irrelevant of who they are, their background, um, their ethnicity, their gender and so on, everyone must have an equal opportunity to show what they're capable of so that the rewards can be handed out fairly. If we don't have those equal opportunities, we don't have meritocracy, as simple as that. Parsons said also that increasingly in modern society there is less focus on ascribed statuses, that is the status you are born with, rather the focus now is on achieved statuses, so the status that you gain through your own hard work, intelligence and efforts. Another couple of functionalists here, Kingley Davis and Wilbur Moore, argued that education is a device for selection and role allocation. So it's a good way of working out who's going to do what job later on in life. They identified there were some inequalities within society, but they argued actually it was necessary to ensure that the most talented undertake important roles. So if some jobs are more important than others, they would argue, although all jobs are important in a sense because they all need to be done. Um, that said, though, you want to make sure that you get the best people in those most difficult or important jobs so that they're done correctly or properly. Otherwise, it could be dangerous to have less able people to perform roles such as pilot or surgeon. They also identified that not everyone is equally talented. They said, in reality, people have different talents. People are suited to different roles in life. It's important, therefore, that we offer higher rewards for challenging roles to attract the most talented. And that's why jobs like uh, piloting or being a surgeon are paid so very well, because they are difficult and it's important, therefore, to attract the best of the best. Carrying on with Davison Moore, education is therefore a proving ground for those with ability and talent. It's a way for people to show what they're capable of. And the most talented will gain the highest qualifications and this will prepare them for ultimately getting those difficult jobs. Next, Blau and Duncan, again in the top right hand corner. Prosperity in modern economies is a product of human capital or hu human skills or workers' skills, they argued. Meritocratic education helps allocate the best jobs to the best workers and thus maximizes productivity. So, what they're arguing here is it's really important to make sure that you get the right people in the right jobs because then they'll be happy and they'll be using their skills correctly rather than perhaps wasting their skills if they were in a job that was too easy or too hard for them. So actually it's a way of increasing prosperity for everyone in our society. In terms of some criticisms of functionalism, well equal opportunities in education may not actually exist and achievement is actually greatly influenced by class. We still find today that the middle class is out from working classes um, despite efforts that have been made by various governments to try and bring about true meritocracy and true equality of opportunities. There's still some more work to be done there. Melvin Tuming criticised Davison Moore by saying, how do we know a job is important? Because Davison Moore seemed to intimate that some jobs are important, and Davison Moore probably would have responded by saying, well, it's, it will be a highly paid job. That's how we know it's important. And Tuming would say, well, then why are some jobs more highly paid than others? And Davison Moore probably would say, well, because they're important. But how do we know the job is important? Because it's highly paid. But why are some jobs more highly paid than others? Because they are important. What you've got here is a circular argument that doesn't really justify itself, and Tumen has some issues with that there. Finally, if 
Functionists argue that education instills the values of the whole of society, but Marxists would argue that education only instills the values of the ruling class, aka the bourgeoisie or the middle class. And if you think about education, most teachers are middle class. Most textbooks and exams are written by middle class academics. So the system is inherently middle class. It's not really teaching the values of the working classes or the rest of society. Final set of criticisms here. Dennis Rahm would argue that functionists have an over-socialized view of students, arguing that they passively absorb information, that they're blank slates or tabula rasa, that they never push back or rebel, and that education is in fact a one-way process of just teachers you know, dumping information into the minds of students, kind of similar to that image in the top right-hand corner there. But actually, that's probably not the case. You know, Students do push back, students do have their own ideas, Often educational learning is a two-way process, so it may be folisome to sort of conclude on the functionist perspective of this idea of children as tabula rasa. Finally, also, the neoliberals and the new right argue that the state education does not prepare students adequately for work, that actually it is very wasteful and it's not preparing people correctly and it's causing problems in our economy, they'd probably argue. They'd even go so far as to say that state control discourages efficiency, competition and choice. Next, let's look at some neoliberal and new right arguments, but a quick overview here. They are quite similar to functionalists. I always think of neoliberals and the new right as almost extreme functionalists. They would argue that not everyone is equally talented. They believe in meritocracy, that education should be geared towards preparing people for the world of work, that education is good at socialising people into shared values, such as competition, and instilling a sense of national identity. And that's why in the UK today, there's lots of focus often by teachers, or at the very least academics and government officials, in trying to teach British values to young people. The key difference is the neoliberal and the new right do not think that education is achieving its goals. They are worried that it is underperforming. Neoliberals and the new right would argue that the one-size-fits-all approach imposes uniformity and disregards local needs. So the way education works now with the national curriculum, teaching everything, uh, sort of teaching the same subjects and topics to all students relevant of where they are in the UK may be problematic. They would say also that consumers have no say and in this situation they're using the language of business to refer to parents and uh, children, young people who are either you know, experiencing education themselves or their children are experiencing education. They would say that the system is inefficient, that it wastes money, achieves poor results, demands little of teachers and ultimately results in a poor economy. And if we think back to kind of the narrative and the language of you know, David Cameron's governments over the last six or so years, that's very much been the language that's been used, very much the rhetoric that's been used. The solution for neoliberals and the new right, therefore, would be the marketization of education, that we need to introduce a market into education. By turning education into a market, it would force schools to compete. So in the same way that businesses compete for customers, perhaps that logic can be applied to education, get schools to compete for customers or compete for students and, of course, their parents. By increasing the, the diversity of schools available, this would give more choice to consumers, which is seen as being a positive thing. And so we have seen efforts to introduce new types of schools, everything from academies to free schools. And ultimately, the idea here is to increase efficiency to save money, so actually bring down uh, the amount of money the government is spending on education overall. Chubb and Moe are two members of the neoliberal new right, and they were interested in consumer choice. They're American sociologists. There they are in the top right-hand corner. And this is what they found. They claimed that the American state education system had failed, therefore it needed to be opened up to market forces. They claimed that disadvantaged groups had been badly treated by state education and that it failed to create equal opportunities, so therefore no meritocracy. They claimed that state education is inefficient, that it does not train pupils or students for later life and for work. And they claimed that private schools are better at doing this because they are answerable to consumers. If we think about private schools for a moment, ultimately parents are paying for their children to go to that school. If they are unhappy with the quality of education that their child is receiving, they simply stop sending their child there. They, they stop paying the money. So ultimately, private schools, notionally anyway, have to keep on top of their game, making sure they're providing the best service possible in order to continue to receive that money to stay in business. Chubb Mo compared the achievements of 60,000 pupils from low-income backgrounds in state and private schools, and they found that the pupils in private schools did 5% better. Therefore, 
the more market, the more efficiency, the more power to consumers will increase that 5%. What they argue should happen, therefore, is to end guaranteed funding for schools by government and, in fact, instead give parents a voucher to spend on education. So, you know, every year to educate a child or a young person, it costs a certain amount of money. Why not actually give that money in the form of a voucher to each parent at the beginning of every academic year, almost as if it was money that they were taking out of their own bank account, and then every year the parent could decide where they were going to send their child and who they were going to give the voucher to. So perhaps that's an alternative. That's a way of almost creating a market-style system within the state education sector. This would force schools to compete for the vouchers and therefore their main source of funding. Neoliberals and new rights do argue for two roles for the state, however. They believe that it should continue to publish a framework for schools to operate within. For example, Ofsted produce inspection reports and league tables, and generally we find neoliberals and new rights think that's a good thing. They would say that they should, that is, the state should continue to impose a national curriculum to ensure students share in the same culture and heritage and thus create social solidarity. So that focus on British values and British history must continue. They think it's important that the state should continue to affirm national identity, again, teaching British history, Christian values, and so on. And in this sense, neoliberals and the new right oppose multicultural education. They see it as problematic. They may even see it as divisive, and they want to think of a way or you know, implement an education process or system that promotes cohesion and unity. In terms of evaluating this perspective, well, competition between schools arguably only benefits the middle classes. The middle class possess the knowledge or cultural capital of how the education system works, so they know how to use it in order to make sure that they get their children into the best schools, they gain access to those better schools. Social inequality and poor school funding could be to blame for low achievement rates, so perhaps we actually just need to up the funding for schools, bring those up to scratch, but also perhaps more needs to be done possibly even outside of the education system, to provide opportunities for working class families or those from poorer backgrounds. There's an interesting contradiction here between the neoliberal new rights, almost obsession of wanting to promote parental or consumer choice, whilst at the same time imposing a national curriculum and saying that everyone must learn that. So on one hand, they're saying more choice, more freedom, allow there to be uh, more diversity even in the education system and who provides, and who provides education. But on the other hand, they're saying, nope, everyone must, must study the national curriculum and learn more or less the same uh, topics and information. So there's somewhat prob some problems there, some contradictions, if you will. Marxists finally would argue that this imposes the cultural identity of the ruling classes once again, not a shared culture and identity. So the working classes and their thoughts and feelings, their, their history is being ignored in favour of that of the ruling classes. Marxists are of the opinion that education is a tool by which the bourgeoisie maintain their position of power over the proletariat. One Marxist in particular looks at this with a chap called Louis Althusser. He identified two tools by which the bourgeoisie maintain power, the first of which is referred to as the repressive state apparatus. The repressive state apparatus are things like the police, the army and the courts. They have what is referred to as the monopoly of violence. They are allowed to or are sanctioned to use violence against members of society. Now, that's not to say that the police, the army and the courts actively go out of their way to use violence on a daily basis. And the vast majority of members of our society will never feel that violence used against them. Instead, it's the threat of the use of violence that is used to maintain control of society and to uphold the, the laws of society and uphold the status quo. And in particular, obviously, for Marxists, they would argue the status quo is one in which the ruling class rules and exploits the working class. They can use physical coercion. They can use force, potentially, to uh, make people do things. Although, once again, as I said, for the vast majority of the time, this never actually occurs. It's simply the threat of the use of force which keeps people in line, if you will. The second tool is the ideological state apparatus, and we're more interested in this with regards to education. Ideological state apparatuses, or ISA, include religion, the mass media, and education. This is the way in which the bourgeoisie maintain their rule by controlling people's ideas, values, and beliefs. So if you think about how education works, ultimately it is members of the middle classes, teachers, uh, 
um, telling young people, telling members of the working classes, but also members of the middle classes too, what to believe, how to understand the world around them, what is true, and so on. And so in doing so, by giving them this information and by deciding which information to include and which information not to include, it's a very powerful tool. It's a way in which, again, the bourgeoisie can maintain control. So Louis Althusser is saying that education is an important part of the ISA, or ideological state apparatus. It creates and reproduces class inequality by imposing the culture of the ruling class onto each generation of working class students. So middle class teachers teach working class students and tell them where their place is in society, what they are likely to achieve in their lives, who they should look up to, what rules they should obey and so on. And it makes class inequality appear acceptable by persuading the working classes to accept their position and to know their place. And so working class students are told from a young age, these are middle class people. This is what middle class people do. These are the types of jobs they will do. These are the types of money they will earn. These are the powerful people in society, the politicians, the aristocracy, the royalty, the whatever. And they've got there because they deserve to be there. And you are not there because your place is somewhere else doing a different type of job probably earning less money. So don't ask too many questions, know your role. And so it's a very powerful tool, once again, um, for maintaining the status quo, the situation as it is. Bowles and Gintis looked at schooling in the United States, and the United States in many ways is the ultimate capitalist society. Capitalism needs a workforce of demoralized individuals willing to accept hard work, low pay, long hours and orders from above. So capitalism needs a constant supply of cheap labor, uh, people who are going to do all the jobs to keep society going and not ask too many questions and not demand too much in return. The role of education is therefore to reproduce inequality and have individuals accept it as inevitable and unchanging. And Bowles and Gittes decided to look at some New York high schools to see how this worked. And they found that traits such as submissiveness and compliance, so doing as you're told, were rewarded, whereas independence and creativity were punished. So in a sense, from often a very young age, teachers and the education system are sort of rewarding certain behaviours and punishing others. And the behaviours that they are rewarding are the ones that capitalists or the ruling classes are going to enjoy in their workers in later life. In a sense, it's also teaching obedience and discipline. The conclusion from the study, therefore, was that schooling creates obedient workers to capitalism. It does not foster personal development. So it's not about individuals and their individual needs and individual desires or dreams. It's about creating a cheap, docile workforce for capitalism. They also identified parallels between the school and the workplace, such as hierarchy. So whereas in school, you might have head teachers in the workplace you will have bosses whereas in school you will have pupils in the workplace you have workers so we've got an interesting parallel there Bowles and Gintis refer to this as the correspondence principle because there is a correspondence between the school and the workplace and you may want to pause the video now and think of some other examples of the correspondence principle but relationships and structures in school correspond with those in the workplace. The correspondence principle operates through the hidden curriculum. That is to say, it's something which is taught implicitly rather than being directly taught. In summary, schooling prepares working class pupils for working class lives and roles. It prepares students to be exploited. It recreates class inequalities and it upholds bourgeois role, rule. So it upholds the situation as it is, the status quo. Another Marxist, this time looking back at the UK, was a chap called Paul Willis, who put together an interesting study referred to as learning to labour. He studied 12 working class boys, referred to as the lads, using observations and interviews. The lads had formed a subculture against the school, making fun of the good kids and the girls. School for them was seen as boring, meaningless, and the students, the lads, broke the rules, often smoking and drinking, for example. They rejected the idea that as working class kids, they could see they believed that succeeding or being successful in school was the domain of middle class students or girls. This is similar to the attitudes of manual workers, male manual workers. So manual work is often seen as superior to intellectual and non-manual work, which was seen as effeminate. So often these boys from a young age were displaying behaviours and attitudes that they would 
carry well into their working lives or indeed that working class men in those jobs already might in fact possess. Students become accustomed to boredom and finding ways to distract themselves and they will use this at work because ultimately they're being prepared to go and do you know, manual labour, which is basic, boring, repetitive and so on. Their acts of rebellion in school guarantee that they will end up in a low paid unskilled job by ensuring their failure to gain wealth while qualifications. So actually, this is the interesting scenario where they are resisting the school's beliefs and values and they're actually destined to fulfill the roles that capitalism needs. But it's a self-fulfilling prophecy because if they had tried harder, perhaps things would be different. But they don't try, so they will definitely fail. And the reason why they don't try is because they think that, well, there's no point because ultimately I'm going to end up in a working class job anyway. So it very much is a self-fulfilling pro prophecy of educational failure. Ultimately, these boys would have ended up in working class jobs either way. If they had followed the school rules, they would have failed anyway as they are working class or by not following the rules and gaining no qualifications. So the system is bent against them. They're damned if they do. They're damned if they don't. In terms of some criticisms, in a post Fordist economy, a different kind of labour force is required to that which Bowles and Gingis described. So earlier, when we were thinking about the division of labour on a conveyor belt in a factory, that's very much an example of a Fordist economy where people were working in large factories producing goods and services, things like Ford cars. But now we live in a post Fordist or post modernist economy. It's all about the individual and individual skills, and it's about being. Um, resourceful, it's about being adaptable, it's about being able to manipulate your skill set to fit the needs of the economy and so that old school of type of labour force is no longer needed. We actually need a new type of labour force. So perhaps actually the education system needs to change or is changing and what Bowles and Kins is referring to is a thing of the past. It seems to assume also that students have no free will, that they're not pushing back, that they don't sometimes um, double back and work really hard when they realise that they could fail or when they think that they're being labelled. You know, students are individuals, they come up with their own ways of doing things. People have free will, they can make their own decisions and Marxist thinkers and all that. So not all students passively accept being programmed or indoctrinated. And Willis shows how working class students push back against indoctrination and it still end up in working class jobs. So there may be a problem Furthermore, Albert Halsey argued that Marxists criticise education but fail to provide an alternative. If we look at some education systems in countries which have in the past claimed to be communist or socialist or inspired by Marxist ideas, they often have performed similar functions. And Marxists arguably take a class first approach and they fail to consider the role of gender and ethnicity, which can have a big impact, as we'll see in other videos. That's it. Thank you very much.